a Senate hearing on the run. Welcome, everyone. This hearing will come to order. We appreciate you being here. We have all been subject to the frustrations and annoyances of receiving unwanted telemarketing calls, also known as robocalls. It seems these calls always intrude at a very inconvenient time. Ten years ago, the Federal Trade Commission and the Federal Communications Commission, at the direction of Congress, established a national do not call registry so that consumers could get some peace and quiet in their homes and stop the torrent of unsolicited telemarketing calls. The idea was simple. Voluntarily register your phone number on a centralized list and telemarkers would be prohibited by law from calling you. The registry has been celebrated across party lines as a successful government program that provides real benefits to consumers. While the National Do Not Call Registry has been effective at limiting intrusions by legitimate telemarkers, fraudulent robocalls have since filled the void and have become the source of understandable anger and frustration among the public. These automated, pre-recorded telemarketing calls that often seek personal information from unsuspecting consumers are an annoyance at best, but they can be devastating for those that are defrauded by them. It's easy to see how consumers can easily be confused by these calls. One common scam involves a call from Rachel from Cardholder Services, offering an easy way to reduce consumers' credit card interest rates. Hello, this is Rachel at Cardholder Services, calling in reference to your current credit card account. There are no problems currently with your account. It is urgent that you contact us concerning your eligibility for lowering your interest rate. Your eligibility expires shortly, so please consider this your final notice. Please press the number 1 on your phone now to speak with the live operator and lower your interest rate or press the numbers 2 to discontinue further notices. Thank you. Have a great day. Another common scam involves robocalls warning consumers that their auto warranty is about to expire. This is an important message regarding your automotive warranty. We have made several attempts to reach you. This is your final courtesy call before your vehicle is reclassified. Press 1 to speak to a warranty specialist or press 2 and your file will automatically be closed. <coughs> In both examples, with the press of a button, the consumer is directed to an individual whose job it is to collect financial information in an effort to defraud them. Even pressing the button they claim removes a caller from their list does nothing more than identify a phone number as valid, likely increasing the frequency of unwanted calls in the future. Law enforcement officials have estimated that telemarketing fraud costs Americans over $40 billion annually. So it is no wonder that robocalls consistently remain a top consumer complaint at the FTC as well as the FCC. The FTC alone receives more than 200,000 complaints about robocalls every month. Complaints received from consumers in the state of Missouri alone have roughly doubled every year since 2009. The FTC and FCC have taken important steps to try and stop fraudulent robocalls. Both commissions have issued rules restricting robocalls and they have taken enforcement actions to protect consumers. Since the National Do Not Call Registry started, the FTC has won more than $250 million in civil penalties and equitable relief for consumers against robocalls. But because these shady companies and individuals are often based overseas and very difficult to locate, the FTC has only been able to collect 15 million out of the 250 million that they have, in fact, gotten authorization to collect. Today, we will hear from the FTC and the FCC about their efforts to implement the National Do Not Call Registry and other telemarketing rules. We will hear about their successes and their challenges in pursuing fraudulent robocalls, as well as their suggestions for how we can stem the tide of the alarming number of robocalls being placed to Americans every day. Advances in technology have made it cheap and easy 
for an individual anywhere in the world with a computer and a broadband connection to make thousands and even millions of robocalls at the push of a button. Last year, recognizing the limits of regulation and law enforcement in stopping these kinds of calls, the FTC launched a public competition asking American innovators to put forth their best ideas for a technological solution that would weed out fraudulent robocalls. In April, the FTC announced its winners. Among the three winners of the FTC challenge was Nomo, Nomo Robo, a technology that would screen out fraudulent callers in much the same way that a spam filter screens out unwanted emails. We will hear from that product's developer about his innovative idea and what it would take to make it or something like it a viable tool for every American consumer. It would seem the technological and legal barriers to a technological solution are not insurmountable. Primus, a Canadian telecommunications provider, offers its customers a free telemarketing guard that similarly screens out fraudulent callers. We will hear from its inventor and chief technology officer about its service. We will also hear from our domestic wireline and wireless telephone service industries, represented here by the United States Telecom Association and CTIA, the Wireless Association, about the steps the industry has taken, is taking, and could take in the future to help address the consumer harm from fraudulent robocalls. Ten years in the National Do Not Call Registry, by all accounts, has accomplished precisely what Congress and the FTC intended. However, Fraudulent robocalls and advancing technology has allowed scammers looking to make a quick buck with no regard for the law, to, they are, remain a serious annoyance and abuse. They remain a serious annoyance and abuse that faces consumers. Similarly, the exceptions to the do not call registry for charities, political calls, and businesses with which consumers have an existing relationship also remain a nuisance for consumers. In exploring regulatory, statutory, or technological changes to address the problem of robocalls, giving the consumers the choice to stop all unwanted calls, charities, political, and businesses with existing relationships to the consumer. Stopping all of those calls, regardless of who places them, should be our ultimate goal. The choice here should rest firmly in the hands of the phone that rings. And I will um, turn it over now to Senator Heller. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, Chairman McCaskill, thanks for holding this hearing. I want to thank our witnesses for being here and those uh, in the audience also that are interested in what I think is a very important hearing. Um, and having your participation is important uh, in moving uh, this forward. Congress has been looking for ways to limit unsolicited telephone calls since 1991 when the Telephone Consumer Protection Act was passed. In 1994, Congress acted again when the Telemarketing and Consumer Fraud and Abuse Preven Prevention Act was signed into law. These law ga laws gave the FCC and the FTC Commission uh, the authority to enact regulations on telephone solicitations and the use of automated telephone equipment to make these solicitations. These laws clearly prohibited any telemarketer from initiating or any seller from causing a telemarketer to initiate an outbound telephone call to a person when that person previously had stated that he or she does not wish to receive a call. So there shouldn't be any confusion to the intent of Congress uh, when these bills were passed. Uh, people have a right to free themselves from telephone solicitations. As we come on the 10th year anniversary of the National Do Not Call Registry, I think it's important to note this has been, to a degree, a successful government program. The FTC and the FCC deserve credit uh, for promoting this program, ensuring its functions, that it functions correctly. Solicitors, for the most part, have honored the wishes of consumers, and when a solicitor has broken the rules, the FTC and or the FCC have acted appropriately. In fact, on June 27, 2013, the FTC announced a $7.5 million civil penalty for violations by a refinancer of veterans' home loans, which according to the FTC is the largest fine that has ever uh, been collected. Despite the popularity of the Do Not Call Registry and the actions of the FTC and the FCC, there has been a noticeable rise in the number of illegal robocalls over the last several years. 
Between October 2008 and September 2009, the FTC received over 700,000 complaints involving calls using a recorded message. Between October 2011 and September 2012, these complaints increased over 2 million. The FTC and the FCC are actively engaged in stopping these illegal robocalls, but they have admitted to the significant challenges they face against new and emerging technologies, including sophisticated voiceover internet protocol enabled auto dialers and the use of fake caller ID systems. Companies using auto dialers can send out thousands of phone calls every minute at almost no cost. Some of these companies do not screen against the do not call registry and use this solicitation to scam an individual. I have here with me a recent article in USA Today that outlined an example of this type of scam. In fact, uh, came out uh, this month uh, on July 4th, and it's called Your Money, Seniors Fight Back Against Robocalls. And it gave a specific example of, of, uh, of what's happening out there. And I'd like to take a couple of paragraphs, if I may. Uh, the automated voice... The automated voice implies that a doctor or a relative signed the consumer up for a medical alert system, and it's all free. Authorities said that in some cases, after consumers press a button to accept the offer, they quickly receive another call asking for personal information, including credit card numbers. This might be this might be con artists trying to get bank or credit card information or a social security number to use in ID theft. Or it's a way to pressure seniors into paying for equipment or services that they don't need. The medical alert system scam is in full swing in Michigan. According to the state attorney's general's office, as well as in other states, including Pennsylvania, New York, Texas, Wisconsin, and Kentucky. Today's hearing is an opportunity for the Senate to hear more about the actions of the FCC and the FTC, what they're taking, as well as from the private sector, on what technologies are available to help consumers free themselves from unwanted telephone solicitations. I'm looking forward to the testimonies of our uh, panelists, and again, thank the Chairman for calling this important hearing. Thank you very much. We will um, now hear from our witnesses, and we have... Um, Two witnesses on our first panel. Uh, the first panel is Loris, Lois Gresheim, which we are happy to have you here, and Eric Bash. And if you all would, um, both from the FCC and the FTC, and we are happy to have both of you, and, and we look forward to your testimony. Ms. Gresham. Thank you, and good morning, Chairman McCaskill, Ranking Member Heller. Uh, I'm delighted to appear before you this morning to discuss the FTC's work to fight illegal robocalls, and we're very much appreciative of your leadership in the consumer protection area. Uh, I'm also pleased to be sitting next to my friend and former colleague, Eric Bash. Uh, both he and the FCC have been outstanding partners in our fight against telemarketing fraud. As you noted, by establishing the Do Not Call Registry 10 years ago, the Federal Trade Commission gave consumers an easy-to-use tool to protect their privacy against unwanted calls. I believe, as you indicated, that the Do Not Call program has been highly effective in reducing unwanted calls from legitimate telemarketers. Enforcing the Do Not Call provisions is a top priority for the agency, and the more than 100 cases filed by the FTC reflect that priority. But several years ago, we observed a troubling shift in the landscape, robocalls. And I want to talk briefly about what gave rise to the new problem and how we're marshalling all of our resources to tackle illegal robocalls and to protect consumers. Technological changes in communication services have brought enormous benefits to consumers by, by the way of lower costs and improved services. At the same time, however, fraudsters have also taken advantage of these lower costs, which brought faster and cheaper automated dialing platforms. Fraudsters have also further exploited caller ID spoofing, which induces the consumer to pick up the phone while at the same time enabling the scammer to hide its identity and location. And of course, with phones bouncing from country to country all over the world, it is now easier than ever for the robocaller to hide. With such a cheap and scalable business model, bad actors can blast literally tens of millions of illegal robocalls over the course of a single day at less than one cent per minute. These robocalls not only invade consumers' privacy, quite often they pitch goods and services riddled with fraud. 
To meet this challenge, we stepped up our law enforcement initiatives. Looking just at the cases we've completed involving robocalls, we've shut down entities that placed billions of such calls, and we've obtained court orders totaling more than $200 million in redress or disgorgement, and also more than $51 million in civil penalties. And we've strategically targeted entities that we believe facilitate the illegal robocallers. Specifically, we've sued entities that afford access to massive dialer or voice blasting platforms that initiate the calls. We've also sued entities known as payment processors that afford access to the financial system and enable the robocallers to process payments from consumers. And of course, our coordination with state, federal, and international partners is as strong as ever. And I am happy to report that some of the individuals sued for, by the Federal Trade Commission for placing illegal calls have also been prosecuted criminally by the Department of Justice. We knew, though, that law enforcement was not enough and that more was needed. Toward those ends, we hosted a robocall summit last October, bringing together key players from key players, engineers, academics, industry members, and, of course, law enforcers. We analyzed the technological changes that had given rise to the robocall tidal wave and existing structural impediments that served as obstacles to enhanced consumer protection. Recognizing consumers' frustration with robocalls, which we all share, we wanted solutions now. So we used the summit to launch the FTC's first public contest, which you discussed. It was a huge success in stimulating the marketplace to innovate and develop technological solutions that would help consumers block illegal robocalls. Mr. Foss's participation in the next panel illustrates the impact of the FTC's competition to spur, challenge to spur competition. He was one of three winners but nearly 800 eligible solutions were submitted, many of which presented well-thought-out technical proposals. And as always, consumer education and outreach remain indispensable tools that complement our law enforcement and policy work. Finally, I want to assure you of our ongoing and sustained commitment to protect consumer privacy and halt illegal telemarketing fraud and by enforcing the Do Not Call Registry and by tackling illegal robocalls. Uh, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Greisman. Sorry, I mispronounced your name at the beginning. Mr. Bash. Good morning, Chairman McCaskill and Ranking Member Heller. Uh, I am Eric Bash, uh, Associate Chief. You need to put your microphone on. There you go. Sorry, thank you. That's okay. <laughs> Good morning, Chairman McCaskill and Ranking Member Heller. I am Eric Bash, Associate Chief of the Federal Communications Commission's Enforcement Bureau. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. Almost every American has personal experience with robocalls, and almost everyone is fed up with them. With our own six-figure volume of complaints last year, we hear you. So what exactly is a robocall at the FCC? What makes one illegal under our rules? What are we doing about them? And how could enforcement be enhanced? At the FCC, we use the term robocalls to refer not to just pre-recorded calls, but also auto-dialed calls, regardless of whether the call is live or pre-recorded. Under FCC rules, these calls cannot be made to a number assigned to emergency telephone lines, lines in guest rooms and healthcare facilities, or wireless devices, except in two cases. One, for an emergency purpose, or two, with the prior express consent of the called party. That means that robocalls generally cannot be made to wireless devices or the other restricted lines I mentioned, even for a non-commercial purpose. Pre-recorded calls to residential landlines are subject to fewer limitations, but only a few less. Pre-recorded calls to residential lines can be made for non-emergency purposes without the called party's consent, but only if the call is made, one, for a non-commercial purpose, or two, for a commercial but not telemarketing purpose, or three, by certain defined persons to deliver a health care message, or four, by or for a nonprofit organization. Any otherwise permissible robocall must also include certain identifying disclosures to be legal. The FCC also recently adopted rules to create a special do not call list for lines answered by public safety answering points and is prohibiting all auto-dialed calls to numbers registered on that list. 
As you know, the FCC shares responsibility at the federal level with the Federal Trade Commission for enforcement against telemarketing calls, including telemarketing robocalls. The agencies maintain consistency between their rules pursuant to statute and a memorandum of understanding. Both agencies' rules prohibit making pre-recorded telemarketing calls to any telephone number, mobile or residential, except with the express prior written consent of the called party. Congress has empowered the FCC to enforce the Communications Act in several ways. The tool the agency uses most uh, is assessment of a monetary forfeiture. Under the Communications Act, the FCC may not impose such a forfeiture on a non-licensee, meaning someone other than broadcasters or carriers, for example, until it first issues a citation to the wrongdoer for an illegal act, and the wrongdoer thereafter repeats the same kind of misconduct. The maximum penalty for non-licensees is generally $16,000, or about one-tenth the amount of that for carrier licensees. Over the last decade, the FCC has issued more than 500 citations and taken approximately 10 forfeiture-related actions involving millions of dollars of penalties for robocall, robocall rule violations. Our two most recent robocall actions cited operators of platforms that, according to our investigations, made almost 6 million impermissible robocalls to mobile phones in just several months. The operators offered a service to call the phone numbers provided by their clients, to deliver the pre-recorded message provided by their clients, and to display on consumers' caller ID the telephone numbers provided by their clients. By focusing on these operators rather than their individual clients, we hope to maximize the impact of our existing enforcement resources. Numerous other platform providers remain under investigation. Significant law enforcement challenges remain, however. A fundamental problem is identifying the wrongdoer. Robocallers often spoof the number from which they are calling, so inquiries to carriers that control the numbers displayed to the consumers may not yield useful identifying information. Investigators must therefore work backwards, subpoenaing the called party's carrier and, in turn, all intermediate carriers to find out where the call originated. Time is of the essence because some providers do not appear to keep relevant records for much time and because the FCC must initiate any forfeiture proceeding within one year of a violation. There are several ways in which the FCC's enforcement tools might be enhanced. Congress might, for example, consider changing the FCC's authority by, one, allowing the FCC to impose a forfeiture on non-licensee robocaller violators without first issuing a citation, two, expanding the current statute of limitations from one year to two, and three, increasing the maximum forfeiture that the FCC can impose on non-licensee robocallers. To address the spoofing that complicates law enforcement, Congress might also consider extending the scope of the prohibition in the Truth in Caller ID Act against changing caller ID for harmful purposes to apply to offshore callers and more uh, VOIP providers than just those who originate and terminate traffic on the public switch telephone network. Congress might also consider giving the FCC regulatory authority over third-party spoofing providers. There are also technological ideas on the table that may afford additional consumer protections from Ill illegal robocalls. The FTC-sponsored contest helped to identify some of these ideas, and an industry standards organization is working with FCC technical staff on still more ideas. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you both. Um, let me start with, um, with you, Mr. Bash. Do the statutes that guide your enforcement in this area, do they provide for the possibility of prison? They do not. Okay. And how about anything that you can do on your end at the uh, we FTC? We do not have criminal law enforcement authority, but we work regularly with the Department of Justice and, and criminal authorities at the state level. Is there an applicable statute that you can utilize at the federal level that provides prison for people who do this? Not on the part of the Federal Trade Commission. Yeah. Well, so nobody's gone to jail, right? There have been criminal prosecutors, uh, prosecutions of individuals who have been sued by the Federal Trade Commission for engaging in illegal robocalling uh, in civil cases. The criminal prosecutions, I believe, have focused on um, allegations of wire fraud. Okay. And so the wire fraud prosecutions that have taken place in the area dealing with robocalls, has anybody gone to prison? Do you know? Yes, I believe there have been significant sentences. Okay. Well, we need to get that word out. Um, seems to me that, you know, these guys aren't really afraid of you. Um, I don't think that they're very nervous at all. <laughs> because it seems to me that they're just all in at this point. 
They've got the technology to do massive amounts of calls for literally scraps off the table with great potential of payoff. I mean, this is a criminal sandbox. And I can't imagine a more fun place to hang out if you're somebody who's a criminal. And um, I think we need to look at that also. Would some additional criminal statutes help you, Mr. Bash? I, I think additional legislation like that could be useful. I mean, the FCC is, like the FTC, is not a criminal law enforcement agency. So I don't think we would be taking uh, the actions ourselves there. But uh, certainly... I guarantee you the criminal prosecutions in this area would be way more popular than just about anything else the Department of Justice does. I'm sure they would be. Uh, I'm sure they would be. Um, what about uh, the, the, the folks that are processing the payments on this? Um, do you feel like you have adequate statutes to go after them and put them in prison? Because somebody is moving this money through electronically, and they're making money off of it, and they have to know um, that this is not mom and apple pie that's being sold here that they're making money off of. I know we've had some actions against the payment processors. Are these, are these um, companies that we would recognize that are processing these payments? The Federal Trade Commission has taken action against payment processors for well over 10 years. Uh, the most recent ones are brought under the telemarketing sales rule. They're alleged to have uh, assisted and facilitated the, the illegal robocaller. Um, and, and we have a burden of proof of showing that there's some level of knowledge there. Uh, I think, you know, there are two scenarios. There, there are those who facilitate fraud who are completely in cahoots with the fraudster. They know exactly what's going on. And then there are those who either know or consciously avoid knowing. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just going to turn on the facts, but, but it is not necessarily the case that those who facilitate fraud, gatekeepers or choke points, are completely in bed with the fraudsters. They may be avoid knowing what's going on. Well, yeah, but they're not hard to catch. Because if you set them up, if they're trying to avoid knowing, nine times out of ten, if you send somebody in undercover um, to say the appropriate things, they're going to say something in reply that makes it clear that they're trying to... It's a little bit like the guy driving the getaway car. Well, I had no idea he was in there robbing the bank. Um, you can't hold me liable. Well, under criminal law, we can you're right. And, you're and this is, they're driving the getaway car. Yes, they're facilitating the illegal conduct. Are these companies that we would recognize that are processing these payments? Are these, you know, the, the, the mainstream payment processors that process um, my payments to iTunes or my payments to Amazon? Are they the same people? I'm not sure that any ones that the FTC has, has sued of late um, are necessarily recognizable names. Uh, but we certainly will be looking across the industry to see whether there are any entities that facilitate. That's fraud. reassuring that you're looking, and I certainly don't, I wasn't trying to make any allegation against those <coughs> companies that they are involved in this. I'm just, no. you know, obviously we're, we're processing a lot of payments electronically these days. And um, there are recognized reputable companies, and then there's others. And I'm just assuming that this is all in the other space. Uh, we, take, we look at each case as we see it, and okay. then we see who's involved. Um, let me finish up, and then I'll give it to uh, Senator Heller. Um, on the caller ID spoof, um, I've been asking my family to keep track of calls. And in fact, I've gotten a few. I've learned something very important. If you ask for a phone number, they hang up. <laughs> They're all trained that if you ask them for a phone number, they immediately hang up because they know there's not a good ending there. So they just move on to the next call, if you've got somebody live on the other end. I also have learned from my family members that they are using fraudulent caller ID numbers. That if you're getting a call in St. Louis, or if you're getting a call in Kansas City, the area code that they're using is in fact a state area code, even though the call is being generated from far away. Many times, not even in this country. Um, can we go after the companies that are providing these numbers that clearly are not the numbers they're calling from? The, the, the uh, folks who are uh, providing the, the false uh, number? Yeah. Um, so there, there's, uh, I, I, 
let me uh, get at that uh, a couple of different ways. Uh, so under the, the, the robocall rules, it's really the, the legal standard is the person who's making the call, who is initiating the call. That's who is responsible under our law for uh, a violation. There is, as I mentioned, um, the Truth and Caller ID Act that prohibits uh, uh, spoofing uh, caller uh, information uh, with an intent to defraud um, or cause harm or wrongfully obtain anything of value. And if the folks that you are referring to would satisfy that standard, those are people that we could uh, pursue. Well, but why would you give a false, why would you make, why would you provide a number that's not really the number they're using for, what, what kind of good could there be? I mean, I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to think about arguing a case to a jury in a criminal courtroom, I I'm under what possible scenario would somebody be providing a phony caller ID number that wasn't up to something nefarious? Examples that um, are, are mentioned uh, in the context of the, the rulemaking that the, FT, the FCC did to implement these rules um, involved uh, like calls coming from a battered women's uh, shelter, that uh, a call might need to be made out uh, by someone who is living there to check on her children, uh, and she is needing to protect uh, the, you know, the actual uh, number from which she is calling. And the, so the, the, the blocked number is not sufficient in those instances? You can't just block the number so people can't see what it is? Uh, that's the, the, the example I gave you is, is the um, what we have pointed to and, and, and what folks refer to as to legitimate uses of, of uh, spoofing caller ID. In the grand scheme of things, I can't imagine that that is not just a tiny infinitesimal number of these that are being given out. And I would certainly like, um, we're going to ask you to do some follow-up on this, but one of the follow-ups I would ask you to look at is what do we need to do to strengthen the laws to go after the people that are providing these phony numbers? Because that's a huge part of the problem. And uh, just to add to that, uh, one of the uh, suggestions that our former chairman uh, made in uh, submitting a report to Congress on potential changes to the truth and caller ID Act was to give the FCC direct regulatory authority over uh, so-called third-party spoofing providers. These are people who are providing a service to people to spoof numbers. Thank you very much. Senator Hel Thank you. Uh, and thanks again, Madam Chairman, for holding this hearing and for our witnesses for your testimony. I appreciate that. Uh, I'd be surprised if there's anybody here in this room that has at one time or another been subject to uh, a, a telemarketing call. And uh, I would submit that I have um, that second recording that you uh, did on, uh, on uh, extended warranties on vehicles. Um, every time uh, uh, my vehicle gets to be about four or five years old, I get that phone call. And uh, when you ask uh, follow-up questions, they usually hang up on you when they find out that, uh, that, that, that they can't deceive you. And in most cases, the deception practice is that you're thinking that you're talking to the original um, maker of that vehicle, whether that's a, a GM product, Ford product, a Nissan product, you think you're talking to that company, at least they give off that perception, then you find out that uh, they're not associated with that organization. Um, so uh, I, I thought that was a, a great example of the type of deception that, uh, that we hear and see all the time. Uh, Mr. Bash, you did a great job in your testimony of coming up with overcoming some of the enforcement challenges that you guys face. And I was wondering, uh, 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 Ms. Greisman, if, uh, uh, if you have other ways, what can we do here in Congress to help allow you to, to, to have more authority? Do you need more authority? I'm going to ask the next panel, of course, the same question. Uh, but what do you need? What kind of uh, enforcement challenges do you face that you need to overcome that Congress can help you with? Well, I, I dare mention the common carrier exemption. Uh, we do think it is, it is more than a relic. The commission is on record for the past several years um, uh, in support of its elimination, and I certainly share that view. Okay, okay. Um, can you, I want to clarify uh, the numbers. You know, you've testified a little bit, both of you, a little bit on the numbers, the challenges that you're faced. Um, can you quantify uh, the cost? of this problem, uh, both in the numbers of calls that people are receiving today and uh, the cost. I know the chairman mentioned some costs, just so that everybody here and those that are viewing this have an idea how big this problem is. 
Sure. Uh, first, with respect to the numbers, we know that through our law enforcement action, we've halted literally billions of illegal robocalls. And we know that from the cases we've brought. We also know that from the cases that have concluded in the uh, robocall and do not call area, that courts have ordered, I think it's $740 million in redress or disgorgement. That, of course, is court ordered. So that is at least a baseline for the scope of the magnitude of the economic injury being caused by this. Do you agree with those numbers, Mr. Bash? Yes, and I, I just want to uh, reiterate what I said uh, in my testimony, that the two most recent actions uh, that we took, uh, we, just the particular months that we were looking at for our enforcement actions, th these two operators uh, had placed approximately six million calls uh, in just uh, several months. How many um, individuals in your office do you dedicate to enforcement of uh, no calls, uh, telemarketing scams like this? Uh, we have, uh, in the Enforcement Bureau, uh, we have a handful of uh, lawyers that are dedicated to dealing with this uh, particular problem. Uh, on the policy side, uh, our cons Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau uh, works to uh, implement the rules and change the rules uh, as needed per uh, any action you may take uh, on Capitol Hill or to uh, uh, harmonize our rules with those of the Federal Trade Commission. Is there a, is there a bureau uh, within the FCC specifically dedicated to uh, telemarketing fraud? There is not one that is specifically uh, dedicated to that. How about the FTC? Uh, at the Federal Trade Commission, telemarketing rule enforcement, te combating telemarketing fraud is, is something that is engaged in throughout the Bureau. Uh, it is, as I mentioned before, a top priority. Right. Uh, and it's not just the Bureau at headquarters. Every regional office is involved in, in the fight against illegal telemarketing. Uh, the shop that I head uh, is the um, manager, coordinator, if you will, of the telemarketing uh, fraud enforcement program. Thank you. I'll preserve questions for later. Thank you. Uh, let me ask just a couple more things. I, I want to make sure that it's clear uh, how technology is changing this landscape. Um, I think everyone's figured out that Congress is not nimble and we do not move quickly and clearly, we are behind the eight ball in many areas as it relates to technology. And both of the agencies you work for have a very difficult job because you're trying to get everyone to hold hands and sing kumbaya when there are competing commercial interests and just competing interests because of advancing technology. This is an area where most average Missourians don't understand why there's a different set of rules for the phone that rings in their house and the phone that rings in their purse. They don't understand why you can take action against a political campaign that calls the phone in the purse, but you can't take action against the political campaign that calls on, in the family room when you're eating dinner. And so would you explain why there would be these different rules and try if you can. I have a hard time with figuring out, I know it, it, it all boils down to wired versus wireless and then the old days when everyone was paying by the minute as opposed to the vast majority of plans now that are, are not, well, there's still plans that pay by the minute. But, um, you know, I, I don't think people, and, and then you've got uh, via VoIP, um, which is, of course, the new method of phone calls that is not the common carriers, but it is a wire nonetheless at some point. And w where do they fall in this? And why should these rules all be different? I'll take a stab um, um, then turn, turn it over to Mr. Bash. From the FTC's perspective, it doesn't matter where the call rings. It doesn't matter whether it's at your home landline or in a device uh, in your car, in your cell, where, wherever you are. It makes no difference. The telemarketing sales rule applies equally. Uh, um, with, and it doesn't matter whether it's coming over a copper wire or through the, through the Internet. Uh, with respect to the charitable calls that you mentioned, uh, uh, the FTC does not have jurisdiction over those charitable, bona fide charitable fundraising calls. Uh, we, we are able to reach for-profit telemarketers who place calls on behalf of bona fide charities, however. Right. So the, the people that call me that pretend that they're really helping the sheriffs and they're really taking 90 cents on the dollar and giving the sheriffs 10 cents, can you go after them? We can and we have. 
Uh, so our, as you heard me uh, testify this morning, our rules do make a distinction uh, between uh, wireless phones and between uh, residential landlines. And the distinctions that our rules make uh, flow directly from the Telephone Consumer Protection Act of, of 1991. Uh, that that's, ob that's obviously up to date. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maybe you'll revisit that. Uh, but uh, that's, that's why our rules uh, make the distinction uh, that they do, because they, the, the, statute, the statutory language is really quite prescriptive. So our rules just track uh, what the legislative distinctions made uh, in the law. And as Lois was saying, uh, with respect to VoIP, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, that's not really germane uh, to the issue, because th what matters is who is calling. Uh, it doesn't matter whether they're calling over VoIP or they're calling over traditional uh, telephone. Th if you're making a call under the circumstances that are not uh, legal, then it's impermissible. Um, I, I think we've got to really take a look at um, updating all of this so that, um, you know, there's a whole generation that is going to be very blessed by the fact that they can't get political robocalls because none of my kids have landlines um, and um, you know they were really glad last October in Missouri because it was ugly out there and uh, the, but the elderly that are still answering that landline every day I, I had a hard time I felt like I needed this when I'd go out in public because everybody was so mad about these stupid political robocalls. Um, let me just finally uh, ask your thoughts. It seems to me that you're playing whack-a-mole, and you're playing whack-a-mole with people that many times are in foreign countries, and um, the long arm of the law is really, really difficult in these circumstances, especially since they can make a lot of money and shut down fairly quickly and move on. And your limited tools in law enforcement do not allow you to be as uh, quick as they are um, in terms of being able to get to them before they've shut down and moved on to another uh, location or another IP address. Um, to talk a little bit about the techn technological solution um, and what you see, are, what are the barriers that are in this country for, I mean, I know, I mean, I look at the technology that is available um, I am, I marvel at what I can do on this little bitty box. And I can run my life, literally, with this little bitty box. It is so hard for me to believe that there is not the technology available yet in America that we can control this without the government uh, having a great deal of involvement, just through a technological answer. And, and if you could speak to that briefly before we hear from our second panel, unless Senator DeHale has more questions. I'd be happy to start. Uh, it's precisely uh, because we felt there would be a technological solution that we launched the challenge. Uh, and, and the goal was to spur innovation, to tap into the genius of American consumers, to develop ideas. And I think it was enormously successful. There were three winners. Uh, but it, it's not just those three, three winners who submitted proposals that might be placed to mark, might go to market. There are others out there. And I think you'll be very encouraged when you hear from Mr. Foss on the second panel. Great. Senator Heller. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bash, you talked a little bit about where these calls originate from, and I was wondering if you have any quantitative numbers of whether these, most of these robocalls are coming domestically or they're coming from foreign sources. I don't think I have uh, data to give you on that. I, I think that uh, they're, they're... Do you have a feel for it? I, I don't want to go out on a limb for that, uh, yeah, but I, yeah. I, I think it's fair to say that I, they're coming from both places. Okay. Uh, they are coming from both, both places. All right. Ms. Greisman, you talked about enforcement challenges, and one of the things, of course, that you asked for is to abolish the common carrier exemption. Um, and, of course, that would protect carriers from dual... Um, uh, dual regulations by both the FCC and the FTC. Uh, I guess my question to you is, is, uh, is there any evidence or allegations that uh, these common carriers are the, uh, are the source of these calls? Let me address that this way. Uh, the, from, wh from where we sit, uh, we think c common carriers can do two things. One is they can be more proactive in looking at what's going across their transom uh, and, and flagging what probably are red flags. 
Uh, we have some concerns that there may be some carriers out there, and, and remember there's a real blurred distinction given the convergence in technology of what is a telemarketer and what is actually a carrier. But we think there is some conduct that may be engaged in by some entities that purport to be carriers that would do more than raise an eyebrow. Okay, okay. I'll probably ask the next panel the same question. Um, if, if I could um, add please, please. Uh, on that uh, subject, um, as I have mentioned in my uh, written testimony, we, we obviously work uh, with the Federal Trade Commission uh, in coordinating law enforcement, and uh, Lois and I uh, actually just last week uh, met on uh, various coordination issues uh, and issues with respect to carriers that uh, she is aware of. Uh, she has made us aware of them, and we are certainly going to be looking at some of the information that was shared with us. Terrific. Thank you for your time. I want to thank both witnesses for being here. And Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just curious, what is the conduct that raises the eyebrow, if you can uh, tell it, us? It's too soon at this point to, to get into. Okay. Thank you. I'll be waiting. <laughs> if the next panel would come forward. I want to thank um, this panel. We have Mr. Kevin Rupi, Senior Director of Law and Policy, United States Telecom Association. Mr. Michael Altschul, am I saying that correctly? Yes, you are. Thank you. Altschul, Senior Vice President and General Counsel at CTIA, the Wireless Association. Mr. Matthew Stein, Chief Technology Officer from Primus Telecommunications. Welcome. Thank you for being here. And Mr. Aaron Foss, Freelance Software Developer, Nomo Robo. Thank you, Mr. Foss. We are um, glad you're here, and we will begin with your testimony, Mr. Rupi. Chairwoman McCaskill, Ranking Member Heller, <clears throat> thank you for giving me the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Kevin Rupi, and I serve as Senior Director of Law and Policy at the United States Telecom Association. U.S. Telecom and our member companies share the subcommittee's concern about the problems associated with illegal robocalls. We understand the consumer frustration they cause, and we have long worked and coordinated with relevant private and government stakeholders to address this issue. In addition to the harm they cause to consumers, robocalls impact U.S. Telecom's own member companies. Our company's customer service representatives represent the first line of defense on this issue. They must be well-versed in explaining to customers the difference between legal and illegal robocalls, providing them with information on how to file a complaint with the FTC, and pointing them to tools to help them mitigate these calls. Robocalls can also adversely impact our company's networks. Mass calling events are typically highly localized, high volume, extremely brief, lasting only a matter of minutes, and carriers receive no advance warning of these calls. A severe mass calling event can result in service degradation and disruptions to phone services in a provider's impacted area. Moreover, illegal robocalls exacerbate an already troubling problem in our industry known as phantom traffic, calls that evade the established intercarrier compensation regime. Given these impacts on both our customers and our networks, 
We can sympathize with the frustration you must feel at the apparent growth of this problem over the last two decades in spite of repeated legislative efforts to put an end to it. Those efforts illustrate the difficulty of keeping the law ahead of the lawbreakers and ahead of the technology. This is not to say that network operators are passive observers. As mentioned earlier, we serve on the front lines of defense and work in many other ways to monitor, mitigate, and respond to this problem. Many U.S. telecom member companies maintain network operation centers that monitor network traffic, conduct traffic data forensics, and initiate mass calling investigations. Our members provide and will continue to develop various services such as anonymous call blocking and other functionalities that help mitigate the problem. Network operators also work within standard setting groups to address issues related to robocalls. Carriers initiate legal actions against robocallers Joining when they us. can be found and coordinate with state and federal law enforcement agencies during ongoing investigations and enforcement actions. Looked at through the lens of history, the explanation for this is regrettably fairly simple. The original phone network was a closed system meaning that voice service was generally provided by local exchange carriers and long-distance companies through only the public switch telephone network, or PSTN, providing plain old telephone service. Today's communication services are provided not by the historical closed PSTN, but by a network of networks. The interdependent, interconnected, and global nature of the Internet means that areas of vulnerability exist throughout the network and therefore cannot be realistically addressed by any single stakeholder. U.S. Telecom supports the development of possible technological solutions to the robocall problem by stakeholders throughout the Internet ecosystem, most of whom do not face the significant legal limitations outlined in my written statement that currently constrain our member companies. But it is unlikely that any single technological silver bullet can permanently address the robocall problem. Today's solution could very well turn into tomorrow's Maginot Line and could have unintended adverse consequences, some examples of which I also outline in my written testimony. The same increasingly appears to be the case for legislative and regulatory solutions, which regrettably do not seem capable of keeping pace with the evil genius of scammers who continually invent new ways of evading discovery and capture, much less prosecution and punishment. In closing, let me again thank the subcommittee for holding this timely hearing. We share both the subcommittee's and consumers' frustration, and we look forward to our continued work together in a manner that provides flexibility in addressing this constantly evolving challenge. I want to thank you, Mr. Ruby, and I'm going to interrupt here for a moment. We've been joined by uh, Senator Pryor, and this is a subcommittee that really has overlapping jurisdiction with Senator Pryor's subcommittee on telecommunications. And so I would like to defer to him for a moment if you would like to, to make any comments at this point, Senator Pryor, before we continue with this panel. That would be terrific. Thank you for joining us today. We, oh. This is, we, we've, between consumer protection and, and your committee, and I know you were the former chairman of the subcommittee, uh, so I really appreciate you cooperating with us and allowing us to have this hearing, even though we could argue about the jurisdiction. No, we're, I'm thrilled. Which that you we are. do around here sometimes, <laughs> okay. I've noticed. No, I'm thrilled that you're uh, chairing the subcommittee now. It's a great subcommittee, as you know, great staff and a great team of people here. Uh, but thank you. Uh, let me just say, um, uh, we have a great leader in Chairwoman McCaskill. She's going to do great things with su this subcommittee, and these are very important issues that you're talking about today. And we may have had some overlap in jurisdiction, but I don't care because I think that you're going to handle it, handle this hearing just great. And uh, <coughs> just want to say thank you for your hard work, and want to say thank you to all the subcommittee members. Um, you know, I look at the numbers; it's clear that the Do Not Call Registry has been a success, and I'm pleased that the FTC is working with states to crack down on individuals with robocalls and other illegal activities. So uh, everybody's working together. We can solve this. So all I want to say is thank you. And I didn't want to interrupt, but thank you. Mr. Altschul. Good morning, um, Chairman McCaskill, uh, Ranking Member uh, Heller and Senator Pryor. On behalf of CTIA, thank you um, for the opportunity to participate 
in this morning's uh, hearing to explore ways to protect consumers against unlawful robocalls and SMS text messages. CTI was proud to support initial adoption of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act back in 1991. Uh, in fact, I had just joined the association. It was one of the first legislative issues I worked on. Uh, like our customers, wireless carriers are also victims of illegal text message phishing scams and robocall campaigns by unscrupulous boiler room operators seeking to sell extended car warranties and the like that violate the protections in the TCPA and other laws. That is why CTI has called on the FCC to change the way it reports TCPA complaints, which as you may know, uh, are divided into wireless complaints and wireline complaints. These consumer complaints are about calls and messages that originate outside of a carrier's network and control. And the way the FCC reports them actually um, tends to hide the magnitude of the problem in their reports. Uh, CTI and our member companies understand consumer annoyance over these calls and repeatedly have pledged our full cooperation to efforts by the FCC and the FTC to bring enforcement actions against robocallers and fraudsters who violate the TCPA. In cases where they can locate and identify the source of the messages, our carrier members have brought lawsuits against the perpetrators, and the industry has cooperated with the FTC and state attorneys generals in their investigation and prosecution of these cases. However, as you've heard from other witnesses, it is virtually impossible to trace an interconnected VOIP call or an over-the-top text message delivered to a wireless carrier from the Internet, especially when the sender uh, wants to disguise his or her identity through the use of proxy servers and spoofed caller ID. I'd like to use a screenshot of a text message that I received on Monday to illustrate the difficulties we face in trying to solve this problem. Um, and by the way, uh, wireless carriers do screen text messages and, and successfully block millions of them, uh, I believe, every day. Uh, voice calls are, are, um, have to be found at the, at the source to, to be cut off. As you can see, this text message appears to be an informational text message about my account at a local financial institution. In fact, I have provided my express prior consent to the financial institutions where I have accounts, authorizing them to send me informational text message alerts about fraudulent activity, data breaches, and other time-sensitive account information. But since I do not have an account at this institution, I knew immediately it was a phishing scam that violates both the TCPA and the Truth in Caller ID Act, which prohibits the spoofing of caller IDs. Uh, scammers, especially those outside of the United States, are not deterred from violating the TCPA or the Caller ID Act. For this phishing scam, the fraudster spoofed the caller ID of a local Washington, D.C. phone number. As it turns out, this number is not in service. It happens to be assigned in a range that's assigned to a CLEC, uh, but I called it and um, got a recording. The message is not in service. It's not a real phone number assigned to a, a user. Um, but the um, fraudster could just as easily spoof the financial institution's actual phone number or tumbled phone numbers randomly to defeat the use of blacklists and whitelists. And this is why this is such a difficult problem to solve. Carriers do not know the businesses and public agencies a customer has given express prior consent to send informational calls and messages. And even if a carrier did know this information, fraudsters can spoof whitelisted numbers and appear to be a legitimate business sending informational calls and messages to its customers. We appreciate the efforts of the FTC and others who are exploring technologies that may minimize the transmission of illegal robocalls and text messages to our customers. However, as H.L. Mencken famously observed, there is always a well-known solution to every human problem, neat, plausible, and wrong. This wise counsel cautions us that any technical solutions must be subject to careful and complete consideration. So on behalf of CTIA, thank you for your consideration of these suggestions. We look forward to working with you to address these and related matters as the subcommittee moves forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. 
Ranking Member Heller and Senator Pryor. My name is Matthew Stein and I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Primus Telecommunications. While my responsibility at Primus cover all of our technology assets globally, my comments today are specific to our Canadian business known as Primus Canada. As in the United States, robocalls are a concern in Canada and I thank you for the opportunity to speak to a technological solution invented, developed and deployed by Primus. Primus provides a, a service called Telemarketing Guard to all of our telephone customers in Canada. This patented service was developed and deployed in 2007 in response to our customers' discontent with their inability to control unlimited unsolicited calling. The concerns expressed by our customers are familiar. Unwanted calls interrupting dinner, interrupting quiet evenings, interrupting family time, and in many cases, the inability to make these calls stop no matter how many times the customer asks to be taken off one kind of list or to be put on another. Before I proceed, it's important to make clear that we view robocalls and automated telemarketing calls as a subset of mass unsolicited calling, which for convenience I'll refer to as telemarketing. Our customers have made clear that their view of telemarketing does not change if they're greeted by a live person or a recorded message when they pick up the phone. Telemarketing Guard addresses this issue by providing customers with control over how they wish to deal with telemarketing calls. When a call is placed to a customer protected by it, our system evaluates the call even before the phone is rung. If the system believes, based on feedback provided to our customers, that the caller is likely a telemarketer, the call does not go directly to our customer. Instead, a message is played telling the caller that the customer does not accept telemarketing calls and invites them to press 1 to record their name so that their call can be announced. The customer then has the choice to accept the call, refuse the call, or send it to voicemail, all without actually speaking to a telemarketer. Telemarketing Guard uses the actions of our customers to identify these telemarketing calls. The system is completely neutral to all phone numbers until a report from a customer is received. As a result, all calls, telemarketing or non, are unimpeded to our customers initially. But if a customer receives an unscreened telemarketing call, it's up to them to decide whether or not they will choose to report that number, which they can do by picking up their phone and dialing a special code. If they choose to report the call, and if a threshold of other customers also reports that call, the system begins to monitor the phone number and scans for a number of behavioral characteristics. For example, these could be frequency of calling, time of day concentration, sequential calling, and so on. There are many, many other elements that are scanned for. All of this is done to determine if the call should be identified as a telemarketer on a go-forward basis. In essence, the system promotes and relies on customer engagement to identify telemarketing calls, but the reverse is also true. If enough customers accept a call from an identified telemarketer, the number will cease to be considered a telemarketer by the system. This is accomplished by a system that requires no arduous maintenance of lists or complicated judgment calls to be made, whether by network providers, by third parties, or government bodies. Instead, the system just tallies customer votes to determine who is and who is not an unwanted telemarketer. In other words, it becomes a living, breathing, crowdsourced list of undesirable telemarketers and robocallers. Further, customers that don't even bother to participate in reporting still benefit from the actions of those that do. This is the defining element of Telemarketing Guard and what we believe makes it unique. In fact, this is what led us to patent the system. Customer engagement and response have been exceptional. Based on our internal surveys, the service has increased customer satisfaction and become one of the leading reasons customers choose to keep their phone service with Primus. In regards to cost and implementation, the system is not complicated or expensive to establish and maintain. Indeed, we currently provide telemarketing guard to all of our customers at no charge. The system can also be grafted easily into existing phone networks, as we did into ours. It can work with traditional landline phones, voice over IP phones, or mobile phones. The service doesn't require customers to buy anything or install anything or configure their phone in certain ways. And finally, the service itself can be adapted and configured to address needs of consumers, telephone service providers, or legislative and regulatory bodies. In conclusion, besides being a powerful consumer tool, we believe the Telemarketing Guard is consistent with the competitive interests of telecommunications carriers to provide valuable new services to customers. Primus therefore welcomes the efforts of this committee to identify ways that consumers can be given more tools to address mass unsolicited calls and to encourage carriers to provide such services. Thank you, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. Mr. Foss. 
Thank you, Senator, uh, Chairman McCaskill, uh, Senate Ranking Member Heller, and Senator Fryer. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity here to, tes to testify. And I'm here to today to illustrate that the technology exists right now to block these illegal robocalls. And while there are some challenges, such as caller ID spoofing and privacy concerns, there are also effective solutions. And to that end, there are three main points that I want to discuss. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about my winning FTC robocall challenge entry. Then I'll discuss some issues and concerns that are involved with block blocking robocalls. And finally, I'm going to discuss the commercial viability of robocall blocking services. So currently, the Do Not Call Registry is almost completely ineffective against these illegal mass-dialed robocallers. So to fight back, the FTC launched a competition to find new and creative solutions to this problem. They chose my proposal, which I call Nomo Robo, as one of the co-winners. And that's a little play on Nomo Robocalls. So in real time, well, here's how. Even we got that. Okay, just, just make it sure. Just make it sure. <laughs> just to reassure you, just I know the rest of the country thinks we're idiots, but we got that. <laughs> just make it sure. <laughs> so uh, here's how it works. In real time, Nomo Robo analyzes the incoming caller ID and the call frequency across multiple phone lines. And if it detects a robocaller, the call is automatically disconnected. And all of this happens before the consumer's phone rings. So as each call is analyzed, a blacklist of robocallers is continually updated. And the more calls that come into the system for analysis, the better that the algorithm works. I actually built this system using the same technology that these robocallers are using. So it's, it scales inexpensively to handle millions of calls. And Nomo Robo works on landlines, voice over IP, and cell phones on all of the major carriers and does not require any additional hardware or software. All that's required by the consumer is a simple one-time setup to enable a free feature that's already built into the switches called Simultaneous Ring. But as with all new ideas, there's always some skepticism. Industry players have expressed three major concerns about robocall blocking. Uh, spoofing caller ID, violating consumer privacy, and allowing legal robocalls. So it's incredibly easy to spoof caller ID to show any phone number, and almost all of the robocallers do that. But while you can falsify the calling number, you can't falsify the calling patterns. So it's a red flag, for example, when the same number, whether it's spoofed or not, has made 5,000 calls to different numbers in the past hour. And it's also a red flag when the same number is sequentially calling large blocks of phone numbers. Both of these scenarios indicate robocalling patterns. And so a static blacklist of known robocallers would only work in a very limited amount of situations. But by combining the caller ID, whether it's real or faked, with real-time calling pattern analysis, robocalls can effectively be detected. So, and also, solutions like these that only look at the metadata of a call, there's no need to monitor or listen into the phone calls, thus assuring customer privacy. The caller ID data, along with the date and time, across many phone lines gives enough of a fingerprint to detect robocallers without having to analyze the actual content of the call. And the final concern that's been raised is how to allow legal robocalls, such as schools and emergency notifications, to bypass robocall blocking. And this can be accomplished by building an, a trusted real-time whitelist. I've already had the opportunity to speak with some of the legal robocallers, and they're very open to working on a solution that allows them to successfully de deliver their calls. They want these illegal robocallers put out of business as much as the consumer does. As my final point, I'd like to show that there is proof of consumer demand for this type of service, as well as commercial viability. After I won the competition, I, had a com I commissioned a nationwide survey that indicated that 57% of respondents would use a robocall blocking service. And further, 17% said that they would pay a monthly fee for such a service. Since the beginning of April, when the FTC announced the winner of the competition, over 3,600 people have signed up on the Nomo Robo mailing list. I've received over 400 emails asking, or rather begging for me to release this service. And based on the feedback that I've received, robocalls are a serious quality of life issue. As many people on this panel have said, I have to agree, I hear time and time again how consumers feel helpless to stop robocalls. And I think it hits at a certain core level, and we've mentioned this, but they're in their homes with their family, enjoying their time, and they're interrupting by a fraudster who's trying to sell them something that they don't want, or they don't need. So, members of this, of this committee, I hope I've effectively demonstrated that the technology to defeat these robocalls exists today. It can be implemented quickly and easily with no changes to the current infrastructure. And while there are some concerns, such as spoofing and privacy, there are also solutions. The market is large and the problem is so irritating that consumers have shown a willingness 
to pay for a solution. So I thank you for your time, and I'm committed to supporting your efforts in any way that I can. I appreciate you being here very much, and, and let me just say, Mr. Stein, um, I was fascinated with, uh, because you've now had experience doing this for years, mm -hmm. and it has worked commercially for your carrier. Absolutely. And so let me just say for the record that the first company that's smart enough to do this in the United States, I'm switching carriers <laughs> to that one. Um, uh, and I think th that the American, and I would like uh, Mr. Altschul for you to address this, and Mr. Rupi, I, I don't understand, um, we've heard two good witnesses that the technology is available. And all of, the, and I understand fear of the consequences and Mencken's quote, and there are, for every action we have in Congress, there is a reaction. On the other hand, if you look at the fears, to me, they are much less than what the reality is now that people are dealing with. Um, so, so why is it that Mr. Foss's technology is not quickly being adapted in these commercial markets? And why is it that Mr. Stein's patented product has not been licensed to an American carrier? Well, I, I don't know about the license issues uh, with respect to... Um, is there a switch? No. Yeah. I'm on. I don't know about the license, license issues, but we do have concerns about uh, in, um, overreaching and blocking legitimate calls. As senators, I'm sure you're more familiar than you'd like to be with the kind of informational robocalls and text messages you receive from airlines when flights are delayed because of weather or other events. Uh, the volume of these calls are unpredictable and they will flood um, carrier networks with identical um, recorded messages and, and text messages, and they'll carry a, a, a caller ID. That caller ID, if it's put on a white list, can then be spoofed, as I think we all agree how easy it is to, to spoof a number, and um, have the same uh, fingerprint or, or, or um, pattern as other messages. One of the well, things... Well, how does Mr. Stein's licensed product, I hate to interrupt you, but uh, if, if I could get a conversation between the two of you, sure. Mr. Stein, address the airlines calling with information that a flight has been delayed. Well, first... In, in reality, how does that work with sure. your technology? Sure. Uh, remember that the technology has been deployed uh, for a number of years, so I'll speak specifically to uh, the Canadian calling pattern, which for the record, I don't have any reason to believe or any different uh, than American. Um, the reality is that the system, the telemarketing guard system itself, will only sort of begin to monitor and therefore take action once there are reports by enough people that say this is an unwanted telemarketer. Further, uh, once that call comes in, the system will not block that call. Uh, being, a, being a, a carrier ourselves, we have always viewed it as our responsibility to put the two people on the phone, not impede that. But it is to give a moment of pause and to get the other party, the calling party, to press one, record their name, and so forth. In the event of um, delayed flights and things like that, uh, these things tend to go right through. There hasn't been any effect. We've never seen a complaint like that. So no consumer is going to call. Nobody's right. going to no call consumer. and say the airline let me know my flight was late. And that's what is the initial. That's that right. is the initial beginning of the block is a, a, a critical mass of people calling and saying, "Hey, these right, guys are ripoff people, or they're trying to sell me siding." They're not objecting. The consumer's not objecting, and, and I, I talk about this benefit in that nobody other than the consumers themselves decide what is and what is not an unwanted telemarketer or robocall. But and my so point is that that number, which is welcome and legitimate and, I, and properly described on caller ID, is basically the identifier that the carrier and the customer and Mr. Stein's system has to track um, wanted and unwanted calls. Right now, there's no need for scamsters to actually pick numbers that consumers would recognize as uh, the source of messages, informational messages they would like to receive. Uh, but there is no limitation on a fraudster's ability to use an airline's number uh, as, to fill out the caller ID um, field 
in the robocalls and, and messages that they send. Well, let me just let me let me address that. So let's assume in Canada since 2007 that a fraudster got a hold of United Airlines number and started using that. How would it work with your system, Mr. Stein, if that happened? If they spoofed a legitimate number that no consumer would complain about, but they started using it, and right. what would happen? How would that work? So two quick comments. First, uh, the system's quite smart, and over the years that we've tuned it and built and enhanced it, uh, we've built in a great many safeguards to prevent this exact thing from happening. And I, I won't elaborate in full detail on all those, but such as to say that if such a thing were to happen and reports were to start to come in, one would assume that at the same time, the airline is using that phone number too. And therefore, a lot of those calls are getting accepted by our customers. So we would be seeing votes going in both directions. And the system becomes increasingly skeptical and looks for what distinguishes the two types of calls and then is able to break them down based on many of the other criteria that are no longer using just, say, the caller ID, which is the thing that is easy to spoof. There are a lot of other characteristics in a phone network that are available that we use. He wins. Well, give me another chance. Well, I, I, I'd be happy to. As Mr. Foss testified, his technology is the same technology or built on the same um, roots as the technology these scammers are using. And what we have found, um, particularly in the area of policing um, text messages that come across carriers' gateways from the, from the Internet, is as the carriers become more sophisticated in looking at the fingerprints, looking at the volume of calls, the number, the speed, the number of identical messages, the fraudsters become increasingly better educated and sophisticated at the same time. So this is a cat and mouse game. You set a threshold, say, originally of 10,000 messages uh, a minute or an hour, and any message volume for identical messages above that would get caught. Before long, the fraudsters set their threshold at 9,000 messages. You lower the threshold again, the fraudsters find out their messages aren't going through, they change um, their threshold to still stay under the, the, uh, the limit. Um, the costs of doing this really are almost uh, zero. Uh, and um, so for every action and every you know, time you raise the wall, the bad guys come back at you with a taller ladder. Well, I just think, I think the point that's being made, and for Mr. Rupi and Mr. Altschild, the point that's being made is um, we have the capability of being as sophisticated in terms of technology as the bad guys. And there are a number of different algorithms that could be used to identify the bad guys that currently our American carriers just aren't bothering to use. And that is hard for me. I mean, I, Mr. Foss is, 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 is on the precipice of, of hopefully rolling out a product that will um, show that Canada won't be a decade ahead of us as opposed to merely, what are we up to now, six, seven years? Um, it, you know, if the sky was going to fall, I think Mr. Stein probably wouldn't be here. So I, 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 I'm dot, um, and Mr. Uh, Ruby, I will wait for Mr. Heller to ask questions to come back and, and ask your take on this, because it worries me that we're going to say, well, you know, if we do this to try to catch the bad guys, they're just going to do something else. Can you imagine the amount of money we could have saved if we just would have just given up on trying to interdict drugs? Well, and to well be if we clear, do that, if we go after their airplanes, they're going to do boats. Let's not do the airplanes. Or if we do boats, they're going to go over you know, the Mexican border. Let's don't do that because then they'll just go over the Mexican border. We just keep trying. Yeah. And I think this is one of these issues that we really haven't teed up yet to really try hard. Well, to be clear, wireless carriers with respect to SMS text messages are doing exactly what you've described. And it's been an iterative learning experience. And some of the lessons learned, uh, it's a, basically a spam filter, but a spam filter for text messages, um, are instructional as to how smart the bad guys are. We're smart. <laughs> Madam Chairwoman, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Stein, I want to talk a little bit about Telemarketing Guard. Uh, is that a, a unique system in Canada? Yes. Are there any other carriers that have anything that's similar to what you have? No. We, we, no. 
Um, how long, uh, you, you talk about years, how long is it taking you to develop this particular system? Uh, we came up with the idea in early 2006. Uh, we had a commercially deployed, built, tested, et cetera, commercially deployed by, I believe, early 2007. Any initial weaknesses to the system, uh, things that... Uh... No, I wouldn't say there were weaknesses. I'd say we, we learned lots in the initial days, but uh, nothing concerning. Okay. You know? um, have no you complaints been a, from customers, et cetera. Have like you been that. approached by any other carriers, whether in Canada or the U.S., uh, to uh, borrow or buy the technology? Uh, a little bit. Uh, we participated in the FTC's uh, robocall summit in uh, the fall last year. Uh, after that, we had a couple of calls, some light inquiries, but uh, nothing pursued too greatly. So you got beaten up by Nomo Robo? Uh, we actually didn't. Uh, well, in fairness, uh, we didn't submit uh, Telemarketing Guard to the challenge uh, as we were not eligible for it. We, we had presented at the summit that preceded the challenge. Okay. Um, do you, are you aware of any barriers uh, that may um, prohibit bringing this kind of technology from Canada to the United States? No, I'm not. Okay, okay. Um, Mr. Foss, congratulations. Thank you. Um, and you said you had about 3,600 people now that have, uh, uh, do, do they buy your product? They download your product? What do they do? How, how, how does someone know uh, to, to get involved in what, what, your, uh, what the FTC has um, produced in this case? Sure. That, and that's the funny part is that it's not even available yet. It was just the announcement. I set up a website, say, I put in my email and said, it's coming soon. 3,600 people said, give this to me, whatever it is. They don't know how much it's going to be, how it's going to work. They just know that there's, there's a problem. So this is just basically the press that, that is, is generated by this and directed them to the website. When do you think it will be readily available? Uh, for, by the end of the summer, actually. So you'll have a, uh, some kind of a uh, program to, to, to make sure that the American public are aware of what, what, what your product is. Exactly, exactly. After the competition, I wound up talking to a bunch of investors. I got enough seed money to go and build this into a beta to actually go and launch it and to address some of these exact concerns to see, you know, the, the best way is, is just to prove that it will work. And one of the things I think that, that Mr. Stein's uh, product is actually better at than, than mine because he is a carrier is, is the worst case scenario, I think, in, in Mr. Stein's case is that the call gets diverted to voicemail. You know, a lot of these things, the, the, the thinking that went into it before everybody had voicemail was that, and especially on, on mine, is that the call is going to be disconnected. You're going to lose the call forever. But now if we can just divert it to voicemail, much like spam does into your spam filter, I think everybody would rather have a voicemail box with five or six robocalls than five or six robocalls. Okay. You, you mentioned during your uh, testimony that uh, there were some industry players that were concerned. Uh, with, with this technology, what have you done to address? What are those concerns, and what have you done to address those concerns? Yeah, so the, the main concern is the caller ID spoofing. A lot of players feel, and they, they say, is that, well, the caller ID is always going to be wrong, so therefore we can't stop this problem. But again, I see it a little bit differently, and by using the caller ID, whether it's real or not, with these calling patterns, a timed calling pattern, that we can actually start, to, again, even if it's faked, it doesn't really matter. The second is the consumer privacy. A lot of people have said that this isn't like email, because in an email you can go and analyze the content, and that in order to do this you would have to listen in on everybody's phone calls. And I don't believe that's correct. I think that using this caller ID with the calling patterns, and again, much like the, the other solutions that are here, some other reported data, the FTC data, we actually have a, a stab at, at, at making this. It's not going to be perfect. It's absolutely not going to be 100%. But even with spam filters today, certain spam gets through. Sometimes real emails get into your spam folder. Uh, and, and I think that we need to try. I think that we need to start somewhere. Mr. Rupi, uh, you said and touched in your testimony that uh, technology is constantly changing. Um, do you believe a solution like this, no more robo, um, is a solution that can work? Senator, that's a fantastic question, and I have to say, I think it's absolutely fantastic that there are innovators like Mr. Ross out there who are um, working to develop these various solutions. And uh, as Mr. Ross acknowledges, there, there are challenges uh, to some of these technological solutions. And my point on the technological issue is that, like so many issues that arise in this Internet space, it is a constantly evolving and moving target. Um, so I think in terms of designing a single technological silver bullet that can 
uh, fully address the robocall issue, th th that will be an ongoing challenge. One more question, sure, if you don't mind. Mr. Altschul, the government agencies cited their number of complaints. Uh, do you find those numbers to be accurate? Uh, carriers receive complaints, the government agencies um, uh, at all levels, federal and, and state, re receive these complaints. So they're, they're accurate, but um, our gripe is the way they're um, actually displayed and recorded by the, the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, they divide it across services and um, really doesn't um, provide a, a clear picture of what's going on or the magnitude of the problem. Has the industry had an opportunity to verify um, the, the uh, number of sites and complaints that... Uh... Well, we're not, I'm not uh, in any way challenging the, the numbers, it's how they're reported. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Ruby, when, when the common carriers see mass amounts of calling, um, in short calls and a, a massive quantity, um, come over the transom. What do you do? Senator, that, that's where uh, during my uh, oral testimony and the written testimony, several of our member companies have these network operations centers. Um, and there are measures that these companies can take to um, address these mass calling events. Uh, and that's where some of these working groups that I mentioned uh, come in. Uh, what do they do now, though? You say they take different measures. Can you give me an example of one of the, you know, you don't have to name the carrier, but give me an example of, you know, let's assume one of my carriers, which is AT&T, let's assume a massive amount comes over in a short period of time in a geographically concentric area. What, do you know what they actually do when that happens, if anything? Senator, I, I know they take actions. I don't know what those specific actions are, and I would, we would be happy to, you know, provide that information. I think that would record. be important for Absolutely. us to know. Sure. Um, and, oh, go ahead. No, and just to keep in mind, oftentimes these mass calling events, I mean, they're, they're not all directly attributable to robocalling events. So, you know, for example, uh, on September 11th, we had mass calling events in New York City and Washington, D.C. So, um, Well, I think that's pretty obvious, though. I mean, obviously, everyone understands that. I'm talking about all of a sudden it's Kansas City. And, you know, it's interesting. I was on a radio program this morning talking about this, and they'd gone out and done a man on the street interviewing people, and every single person they talked to said they'd gotten a call about sighting. So clearly there had been a massive amount of calling in the Kansas City area about sighting. And that's what I'm talking about. I mean, obviously, there's nothing going on. There's no extraordinary weather event. You know, if a plane's late, we're talking about maybe 100, 200 people. We're not talking about thousands. I need to know what, if anything, these carriers are doing, and, and do they feel an obligation to do something? Well, and they're, they're certainly um, taking action on those issues, Senator, but I think one of the points that was raised earlier uh, by various folks on the panel here is that uh, under our current legal framework, uh, regardless of whether it's a mass calling event or sort of a standard calling volume, uh, we are under a legal obligation to complete those phone calls. And, well, and so you're saying that you legally couldn't adopt Mr. Stein's technology? As I it doesn't, it connects, it just decides whether it goes to voicemail. As, as I understand uh, Mr. Stein's and Mr. Ross's technology, uh, to a certain degree, you have these, the decision is removed to a certain degree from the consumer and is made by uh, the, no, the that's carrier. No, that is not true. I don't think that's true, Mr. Stein. The carrier is not making the decision, is it? No, the carrier does not make that decision. I can only speak, of course, to our system. The, si the system doesn't block a call under any circumstance other than if the customer were to say, here is one given number that I don't want, a blacklist available on many services. In the case of Telemarketing Guard, it impedes the call and asks the caller to press a digit record their name. But in all those cases, those recorded names, the phone call is made, et cetera. And I'm not a lawyer, so I can't speak to the legality of it. I'm sure we have a lot of them in the room, though. <laughs> I would really appreciate, Mr. Rupi, if you would take back to the um, legal staff uh, at your organization 
the specifics of both Mr. Stein and Mr. Foss's technology and get back to us with what specific problems from a legal framework you believe that there are. Um, I think if this were offered by a carrier, uh, you know, I, I'm just shaking my head that American carrier has not tried to adopt one of these technologies because I think it's such a winner in an open, capitalistic, competitive market. And by my television ads that I watch, all the carriers are pretty darn competitive right now. I mean, they are desperately not just trying to get new customers, they're trying to hold on to customers. Because, you know, now that we can take our phone numbers, there is this incredible desire to see if you can't get somebody to walk from someone else to you. And I'm just, for the life of me, I can't figure out why you all are not more aggressively going after this very desirable technology on, the, on behalf of consumers. Senator, we can absolutely provide that information. And, and just to be clear, I mean, our member companies do offer, and we, I always encourage consumers to reach out to their respective carriers to see the services that they are offering. And they do range from things like uh, whether it's caller identification to conditional call forwarding to anonymous call blocking. There are tools that the carriers are providing and continuing to develop. Um, and again, we, we operate under that very stringent um, obligation to complete those calls. And it's very clear to us uh, that that is something we need to comply with. Well, I, I, um, I, I don't want anybody to break the law. <laughs> But I have a feeling we can do this um, with the technology that's out there uh, without breaking any law, and maybe even without us having to write any laws. And wouldn't that be special? Um, because it's always nice that we can reach a marketplace solution in the private sector. And I know that I'm getting a nodding head from Senator Heller right now. It's always better to do it in the marketplace with a competitive solution as it relates to capitalism than it is for the government to come in with a heavy hand and try to impose a solution. Um, so I, I think it's pretty important that um, we hear from you about what you see the legal missteps would be since we have an example of technology that's been used in a country that also embraces capitalism and um, <laughs> it seems to be working and working well for their company. So I, I, I would really appreciate you all with that follow-up. Uh, do you have any other questions? Yeah, I do. And thank you. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, and thanks for your comments and, and to follow up. Uh, and, and this is for the panel. I guess the bottom line with this particular hearing is should the FTC and the FCC be given enforcement powers or additional enforcement powers, or can this uh, be solved through the private industry itself? Ms. Rupi? Senator, I think, uh, as Senator McCaskill uh, mentioned earlier this morning, um, the, the existing legal framework dealing with robocalls appropriately targets uh, the bad actors uh, who are engaging in this fraudulent activity. And I think to the extent uh, that we continue to, to target that enforcement and make that enforcement uh, aggressive against those actors, uh, that is the ideal solution here because, it, 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 as I've said in my written testimony, um, our member companies work with uh, agencies like the FTC to prosecute these acts. We want to catch them as much as uh, everyone here in this room. I would agree. I, I think it requires a holistic solution. Uh, everybody has to um, play a role, and certainly the enforcement agencies are, have a critical role, as do um, consumers, as, as does the industry. One of the things that our industry um, has begun looking at, which um, is far from um, yielding any, any um, results, is how to better map uh, the, and, and trace these calls and messages when they cross through the internet to um, traditional carrier network. Uh, as you may know, carrier networks, when they were closed, used a signaling system called Signaling System 7. There never was a, a System 8 uh, as a way of, of setting up and identifying calls for billing, tracing, all kinds of things. 
The internet uses a system called SIP, Session Initiation Protocol, and mapping or, or being able to, to marry these two very, very different kinds of, of protocols is part of the problem right now that enforcement agencies and everyone is having in trying to trace this uh, back to the source of these messages. And if the technical experts um, who have begun to work on this marrying of, of SIP to SS7 um, uh, messaging protocols are able to solve that problem, uh, we will um, enable you know, great progress in identifying and, and, and stopping these messages at the source. I'm going to guess Mr. Stein and Mr. Ross believe that there's a private sector solution uh, to these problems, and, uh, and I'll leave it at that. I just want to ask one more question for you, Mr. Rupi and Mr. Al Schultz, if, there's, if you have any response to the FTC uh, uh, raising the issue of abolishing the common carrier exemption. Do you have any, any feel on that? Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of the common carrier exemption, Senator, um, I think as Senator McCaskill raised uh, in her testimony this morning, we, we have these issues where we have sort of conflicting regulations, one for wireline, one for wireless. And I think to the extent you start expanding uh, the scope of, you know, numerous agencies regulating uh, similar players in the field, that gets to be problematic. S second, um, we fully support, and it sounds, what, what I thought I heard in the earlier testimony is uh, from the FTC, that to the extent there's an entity out there engaging in illegal activity, they're going to go after that entity as well they should. And we, we fully support that, whether they are a common carrier or whomever. As, as the FCC's Mr. Bash testified, there's um, an existing working relationship between the two agencies. They're both enforcing the, the same laws. And uh, I think that there are some institutional um, advantages that each institution has developed in, in their respective uh, areas. Uh, I'm not aware that, the, um, that it's, it's a problem um, that has actually deterred any kind of investigation or enforcement activity. Okay. I want to thank the witnesses uh, for your time and energy. And, uh, Madam Chairwoman, thank you uh, for holding this hearing. I appreciate everyone being here. I, um, I will tell you that I know that there's concerns and all the concerns about what can be done are based in wanting to follow the law and stay true to what your mission is as carriers, whether it be wireless or wired. Um, I do want you to know that I'm going to follow up in three months and ask uh, to find out uh, what your members are doing in this regard and what they feel like they can do and whatever information that you can give us in the next three months that would spell out the problems you would have with adopting either the technology that Mr. Foss is ready to roll out by the end of the summer. Do you know what it's going to cost, Mr. Foss? Uh, I'm actually hoping to offer it for free. Okay, so are, am I going to have to look at ads? Uh, no, actually, because I figured that on the other How are you going to do that? Yeah, we so know we have to look at ads if it's free. I didn't put this in, in my, my testimony, but there's, uh, this problem doesn't only affect the consumer. It affects businesses. And right. as, as the, the other panel talked about, it, the, the PSAPs, the emergency call centers, uh, the FCC put me in touch with the organization that manages a lot of these 911 centers. Uh, I think there's over 5,000 of them. Uh, you know, this do not call list is, is being implemented. And they asked me, that, you know, I said to them, I said, if there was a blacklist, a real-time blacklist, an up-to-date list of the numbers that you shouldn't be answering, would that be helpful? And they said that they had never even thought about that. And if that existed, it would be amazing. So I think that there's an actual, you know, this data set of the real-time robocallers and the calls that you shouldn't pick up on, even if you think on the, on the, the consumer side, uh, or no, I'm sorry, on the, the business side, anybody who has large call centers, you know, thousands of phone lines, and I spoke to some that are in financial services, uh, you know, the, the, the city banks and the chases of the world, every call that comes in, they have to go and screen for fraudsters. So if they know before they even send it for screening that they should immediately dump it, I think that there's a real valuable asset there. So I think that by doing it with the consumers and offering them, uh, you know, a, a, a really good service of blocking the robocalls. My, my my thesis is that I can I can make money on the, the business side. On the business side. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, you don't need to worry when you roll out. I'll give it a try. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> and um, thank you, Mr. Stein, for coming from Canada. And we'll look forward to following up with our carriers here in America to see if we can't reach a solution. Because I do know this. Um, with the technology that's available, if it's just about chasing these guys law enforcement-wise around the country, we're never going to get the results that consumers deserve on this. So I thank you all very much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.